All right, well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Talks at Google. Um, today's subject is a very momentous one. It's a very um, powerful, um, a powerful presentation we have for you today. Um, throughout, throughout the latter part of the 20th century, the idea of disarmament has been one of the chief causes and the chief, um, the chief focal points of world peace. And today we have, have in our midst um, several heroes who helped negotiate some of the landmark agreements during the Cold War and in the 1980s and 90s. Um, the threat of nuclear terrorism still looms today, and these, these men are, are also working to help um, control and contain that threat. Um, we're joined today by Profes Professor Phil Taubman of Stanford University um, for a discussion about his book, which is entitled The Partnership, Five Cold Warriors and Their Quest to Ban the Bomb. And we're honored today to have three of the five warriors in our midst. We have Secretary of State George Schultz, Senator Sam Nunn, and Secretary of Defense William Perry. Uh, we'll have time for Q&A at the end, so please feel free to use the microphones. And for those of you who are in our six um, remote offices dialing in, you can also find our Google Moderator link at go slash cold warriors. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming everyone to Google. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, all for coming, and thank you, Larry Page and Google, for hosting us today. And my thanks to three of the five men who are the uh, subject of the book. Uh, so let me begin uh, by setting the stage briefly for a conversation that we'll have and, and we'll have with you as well about nuclear weapons. Uh, as was just noted, I think uh, there is a sense, uh, a false sense, that when the Cold War ended with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, uh, that the threat of nuclear uh, attack also ended. Uh, and that is a misunderstanding uh, of our history, unfortunately. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at what's happened since the end of the Cold War, I think President Obama captured the the uh, paradox very effectively uh, when he spoke in Prague uh, shortly after he was sworn in as president. He gave a very eloquent and important speech there in April of 2009 about nuclear issues. And in that speech, he said, today the Cold War has disappeared, but thousands of those weapons have not. In a strange turn of history, the threat of global nuclear war has gone down but the risk of a nuclear attack has gone up. What he's referring to uh, primarily is the risk of a nuclear 9-11, uh, which is actually uh, as uh, far-fetched as it sounds, uh, is a real possibility at some point. Uh, one that's hard to imagine, but one I think that, that the country has to come to grips with to try to prevent. And when I was researching the book, <coughs> Uh, I spent some time with Bob Gates, the Defense Secretary, uh, who served in both the Bush and Obama administrations. And I asked him a question about what essentially keeps him up at night, and here's what he told me. If you were to ask most of the leaders of the last administration or the current administration what might keep them awake at night, it's the prospect of a weapon or nuclear material falling into the hands of al-Qaeda or some other extremists. And it doesn't have to be a weapon. It could be nuclear material with regular explosives and produce a degree of contamination that would be catastrophic. And finally, from the book, let me uh, read you a comment from Henry Kissinger, who is one of the five men that I've uh, chronicled in this book. And Kissinger is talking here about uh, the reaction if there were to be a nuclear 9-11 or some other kind of nuclear exchange. And what we here at Google and in the Bay Area and frankly around the world, what people would be thinking at that point. And here's what he said. Once nuclear weapons are used, we will be driven to take global measures to prevent it. So some of us have said, let's ask ourselves. If we have to do it afterwards, why don't we do it now? The book and this discussion that we're going to have it really is, it focuses uh, on the uh, nuclear threats that we continue to face today. 
uh, which are quite considerable. Uh, unbeknownst to most of us, uh, during the Cold War, the United States and Soviet Union uh, distributed uh, research reactors to dozens of countries around the world and provided those nations with highly enriched uranium to operate those research reactors. For years, uh, this material was sitting around in poorly uh, secured facilities, as I say, in dozens of countries. It's only been uh, really in recent years that the United States and Russia have made a concerted effort to try to secure this material, thanks in large part to some legislation that Senator Nunn authored with his Republican colleague Richard Luger from Indiana, the so-called Nunn-Luger legislation, which you may have heard of. Uh, but the truth is today there still uh, is tons of highly enriched uranium, which is the critical component of a crude nuclear weapon. There's still tons of it spread around dozens of countries around the globe. And it doesn't take much highly enriched uranium, uh, roughly 60 pounds uh, to make a bomb. Uh, and the technology for that kind of uranium bomb is very straightforward. It requires some uh, engineering skills. Uh, but it's not beyond the capacity of a group of uh, reasonably sophisticated engineers and the kind of equipment you can buy off the shelf uh, to make a weapon. And when the United States uh, developed the first nuclear weapons uh, during the Manhattan Project in World War II, the first bomb that we dropped on Japan, the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, was a uranium bomb. Uh, and Robert Oppenheimer and his fellow scientists who... Uh, managed the uh, Manhattan Project. We're so confident of that technology, which essentially takes two pieces of, uh, of highly enriched uranium. Uh, as I say, you could do it with 60 pounds and brings them together at, at uh, very high velocity. And when the two pieces come together, you get the critical criticality, the chain reaction that releases this huge amount of energy. That was so straightforward, they did not test that bomb before it was dropped on Hiroshima. The bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki was a, plut was a plutonium bomb, different, more complicated implosion technology uh, uh, with plutonium. Uh, that bomb was tested in New Mexico in 1945. Uh, so I think that just kind of sets the stage here for a discussion. Uh, as uh, was indicated when we were introduced, th these three men have devoted uh, a great deal of time in recent years, a time uh, when they could be enjoying themselves on the golf course uh, to trying to deal with this issue. And I think we have to listen to them because the three here and their two colleagues, Sid Drell and Henry Kissinger, they're all men uh, who worked very hard to maintain America's defenses during the Cold War. Uh, they were stalwart Cold Warriors. Uh, they were the builders, the maintainers, the stewards of our huge nuclear arsenal during the Cold War. At its peak, the United States and Soviet Union, believe it or not, had a grand total of about 70,000 nuclear warheads. Numbers come down. It's now around 20,000, but 90% of those are still under the control of the United States and Russia. These men uh, know about nuclear weapons. They know about the damage that can be uh, produced by a nuclear detonation in a city. Uh, and they've devoted themselves to trying to reduce these dangers. President Obama has embraced a lot of the policies that they've advocated, including their aspirational critical goal of eventually eliminating nuclear weapons. So if I may, Senator. Bill, let um, me interject yes. something that builds on what you just said. Sometimes people say, well, this sounds good, but it's impossible. You can't really get anywhere. But you gave some numbers, 70,000, more or less at the time of the Reykjavik meeting between Reagan and Gorbachev, and now, 70 to 20. It shows you, yes, you can accomplish a lot. It's not futile to be working on this. You can get somewhere, and that's a, an example. Good, good point, thank you. <clears throat> Senator Nunn, um, as the author of Nunn Lugar, when you look back over the, the 20 years or so since then, uh, how would you rate what we've been able to do in terms of preventing proliferation? Well, it's very hard to quantify something that did not happen. But after the Soviet Union broke up, uh, I happened to be there when they were having the debate 
about breaking up and I got on the airplane and came back with the determination to try to do something to help the former Soviet Union, which was about to be uh, control their nuclear, not only nuclear, but chemical, biological, uh, not only weapons, but materials, because huge, huge quantities of materials. We joined up, as <coughs> Phil said, Senator Luger and I, and passed the non-Luger legislation in actually the late fall of 1991. 91, right. When, it, when the, right when the empire was coming apart. Very fortunately, uh, within the next couple of years, Bill Perry, um, who had helped envision this idea, uh, became Secretary of Defense, and he and his team did a superb job of uh, implementing what was really more of an authorization than it was an absolute mandate. Uh, we, I, I score uh, us pretty well on, on what's happened in the last 20 years. In terms of uh, one of the immediate outcomes that happened in the next two or three years after the legislation passed, was that uh, there were four countries that ended up with nuclear weapons when the Soviet Union broke up. Russia, of course, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan. Three of those four countries gave up all their nuclear weapons. And if you take the arsenal of those three, uh, that basically exceeds the arsenal of China, of Great Britain, and France. In fact, Ukraine alone had more weapons than China, Great Britain, and France. Uh, so I would say on that score, I would give pretty high marks. On the score of preventing nuclear materials from leaking out to terrorist groups, you don't know what you don't know. So no one can ever exclude the possibility that some of that happened. But uh, I believe if terrorist groups had nuclear materials in sufficient quantity, they would have already attempted to make a nuclear weapon. So perhaps we have been su successful in that regard. But it's a continuing battle. There's still a huge amount of nuclear material in Russia. Kazakhstan has some. Kazakhstan has probably done better than anyone else. And just as uh, if you look at the paper this morning, you'll see that Ukraine, as well as Mexico, in this Seoul uh, Security Conference, which is one of the real positive developments, it's a follow-up to a conference that was held in Washington two years ago with over 40 heads of state. Here in Seoul, Korea, as we speak, over 50 heads are state of there, and they're concentrating on nuclear material protection. Both Ukraine and Mexico have given up now all their highly enriched uranium, so they no longer have the materials that... Uh, would be used to make a bomb. So we're making progress, another uh, sign of progress. Uh, during the George W. Bush administration, a program passed, which I think was enormously important, remains important, called Global Threat Reduction Initiative. It was funding to help get nuclear material back from places all over the world. A few years ago, there were 40 countries that had enough weapon-grade material to make a bomb. Today, there are 32. And with Ukraine and Mexico, we can perhaps say down to 30. So we're making progress, and that GTRI program has been the basis uh, with non Luga and working with Russia on getting control of nuclear materials. So on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, in terms of material protection, I think we've moved up the ladder somewhere in the about 7 neighborhood, but it's a dynamic, continuing problem. And it's not that it's a static problem, it's a dynamic problem. India's continuing to make nuclear materials. Great Britain is making nuclear materials. Japan's making nuclear materials. Uh, not for the purposes necessarily in Japan and Great Britain of making a bomb, but the dilemma is the same material you use for legitimate purposes and blend it up to about 4 or 5%. If you take it up to 20% in uh, enrichment, it becomes weapons usable. If you take it up to 90%, you got yourself a bomb. It's the same technology. But one, one encouraging thing in kind of wrapping up this particular thought is that since 1991 we have been working with Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, Kazakhstan, and other countries in the former Soviet Union. Uh, during the Bill Perry administration as Secretary of Defense, we made a deal with Ukraine to basically have their nuclear material sent back to Russia that was coming out of those weapons, the highly enriched uranium, blended down in Russia and we bought it and we are still buying it. It was a 20-year deal. So if you look at nuclear power in this country today, 20% of our electricity is nuclear power. 50% of the fuel going into that nuclear, those nuclear power plants is coming from the blended down highly enriched uranium that during the Cold War was aimed at us. So by definition, 10%, one out of every 10 light bulbs, one out of every 10% of any electricity in this country is coming from materials that win nuclear weapons aimed at us during the Cold War. So progress can be made, as George Schultz said. Progress is being made, but there's a long way to go. 
Let me ask about uh, progress in a, in a slightly different area, which is the uh, continued presence of large nuclear arsenals. The United States uh, has 5,000 warheads still. Uh, under the new START agreement with Russia, we'll eventually come down to 1,550 of those warheads being on active alert, meaning the president can order them uh, launched uh, on very short notice. The rest uh, are in reserve. Russia has uh, agreed to come down to that level, too. In uh, South Korea today, Secretary Perry, uh, President Obama said that the United States uh, has more nuclear weapons than it needs. Uh, if you were advising the president today, or we're still Secretary of Defense, how many nuclear weapons do we need on uh, reasonably short alert at this point? I don't think we need any on short alert. We are not faced with that kind of a threat today as we thought we were during the Cold War. How many we need? to give us a level of deterrence, that is to stop other, any, any other country who has nuclear weapons from, from thinking they could attack us, is measured in the hundreds, not in the thousands, a few hundred, I would say, at the most. Getting down to that number is a huge political problem. It has nothing to do with the needs for deterrence. It has to do with the fact that many people in this country, maybe most people in this country, would be elected, elected for us to come down to a few hundred nuclear weapons if Russia still had a few thousand. Whether that's a rational judgment or not, that is a judgment, I think, which would be made. And so other administrations, this administration and previous administration that worked this problem have always tried to work nuclear disarmament in a bilateral way, that we come down arm in arm with the Russians, either through agreements or more typically through treaties. So the question then is if, if we did conclude we could come down to a few hundred, could we get Russia to come down with us? And the answer to that is probably not at this time. I just, matter of fact, just come back from Russia. I was there Friday and Saturday discussing these issues. Uh, the problem is that there's a dramatic asymmetry between the United States security position and the Russian security position. They believe that they are surrounded by instability, inst unstable countries and some hostile countries, they believe correctly that their conventional military forces are very weak, and therefore they lean on their nuclear forces as an offset to that weakness. And they have reached, they did agree with us on the New START Treaty to come down a modest decrease of what they have, but they're going to be very, very hard to persuade to get down to levels of a few hundred because they feel that their security is very much at stake. So the, sh so the short answer to your question is we could certainly we could maintain a high confident level of deterrence with a few hundred, not a few thousand, nuclear weapons. <coughs> and, but I doubt that we are going to be able to get there politically unless the Russians agree to go with us. And my present reading of the Russian view is they're very unlikely to be able to make major cuts. They might make a small further token cut, but they're not willing to make major cuts. Now, besides the weapons which we negotiate and the START treaties, which are what we call and they call strategic nuclear weapons, they have probably four or 5,000 tactical nuclear weapons designed, to, as they see it, to protect them from any problems with neighbors on the southern borders. So that is the asymmetry. It's a real asymmetry, and that's a real impediment to moving forward. I'm not totally discouraged about the prospects, but we have to recognize that as a major obstacle, that they look at their nuclear weapons much differently than we look at them. So either we have to find a way of persuading them that it's safe to come down, or we have to be prepared to go down unilaterally to the lower numbers, only hoping that they will follow in time. You know, it's- Let me it's, underline something that Bill said at the beginning of his remarks. He said, we don't need any deployed on short-term alert. Think of it. We and Russia have a thousand or so nuclear weapons pointed more or less at each other on an alert system whereby if you have a warning of a missile coming at you, you've got only a matter of minutes to decide whether to retaliate. It is an insane 
arrangement. I can't think of any conceivable dispute we could have with Russia that warrants the risk of a nuclear exchange. And this kind of short-term alert status, Sam has talked about this a lot, just doesn't make any sense at all in this circumstance. So I should think that's something that could be uh, pointed to. Early in his administration, President Reagan asked the, chair, asked the Joint Chiefs of Staff to tell him what would be the result if there were a Soviet attack on us with nuclear weapons. And they took their time and they came back with the answer, initial casualties, 150 million. And cascading casualties after that because we have no infrastructure left. Would he retaliate? Yes. Result in Russia or Soviet Union then, something similar. So he always said, what's so good about ma maintaining the peace by an ability to wipe each other out? What have you won if you're both wiped out? But the system of these short-term um, trigger points still is there. And it's just insanity. So Secretary Schultz uh, is the uh, only person in this room who actually sat at a bargaining table with the leader of the Soviet Union and discussed eliminating nuclear weapons entirely. That was at the Reykjavik summit between <clears throat> Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan in Iceland in 1986. You now, uh, along with your colleagues, uh, have um, moved the discussion about eliminating nuclear weapons back into uh, a position where it's being seriously considered and discussed. How would we achieve that goal, Secretary Schultz? Well, what we're, do we're working at it, and attitudes have changed. I remember when we came back from the Reykjavik meeting, I was virtually summoned to the British ambassador's residence to meet with Margaret Thatcher, who came over. You know, she used to carry a little stiff handbag. And I learned that there is a verb in the British language, to be handbagged, beaten up. <laughs> is is so, that in the movie, The Iron Woman? <laughs> I don't know. But I got handbagged. George, how could you sit there and let the president agree to get rid of nuclear weapons? But Margaret, he's the president. Yes, but you're supposed to be the one with his feet on the ground. But Margaret, I agreed with him. And her reaction was, fairly typical around Washington and elsewhere, that this was the kind of result you expect when two leaders get loose from their bureaucracies and talk about what's on their minds. <laughs> but now, after we issued our first op-ed about five years ago, the atmosphere is entirely different. I don't mean that everybody is agreeing with us, but there is much more willingness to talk about it and in many cases to join us in uh, an effort to get rid of nuclear weapons. So I think that the whole atmosphere has changed and changed for the better. There have been four, 14 countries, George, to your point, where <coughs> former secretaries of state or defense or top officials have basically written and endorsed our position on this, what we call the vision and the steps. Uh, the vision being a world without nuclear weapons, the steps, all the hard things you have to do to get there. Everybody knows you have to get there step by step. But nevertheless, we've had about 14 countries that have now endorsed that. And there are networks both in Asia and in Europe that are working on this issue now. Actually, the let me inter Let me point out, there's a very interesting interaction between the vision and the steps. Because if you have a vision of where you want to go, what does it do to you? It causes you to say, how do I get there? Then you start thinking of things that are doable, that you could do. And the more you develop those, the more the vision takes on the air of reality. And the interesting thing about it is that each step that we have recommended, if taken, for example, if this effort that's going on now in Korea, as it becomes more successful, getting control of fissile material, as that is done, it makes the world safer, as Sam has developed earlier. So there's a nice interaction between having a goal and the steps you need to get to, to get there. And all the steps would be positive. Excuse me, sir. No, that's fine. Uh, uh, let's go to uh, questions in a minute. I just was going to note that um, the book actually opens with a scene at the United Nations in 2009. The Security Council met, you may remember this, it was uh, 
uh, the 15 nations on the Security Council were represented by the heads of state from each of the nations, and the chair that day was President Obama. Uh, and at that session, I think uh, Secretaries uh, Schultz and Perry and Senator Nunn and Henry Kissinger were actually in the Security Council chamber that day uh, watching the discussion. And at the end of the meeting, uh, the Security Council voted unanimously uh, to embrace uh, the goal of uh, eliminating nuclear weapons uh, and to call for the kinds of restraints that have been advocated by the gentleman here. So let's uh, begin with some questions here uh, in Mountain View, and I know there are people at other Google locations. Uh, if you send in your questions, we'll field some of those as well. So please. Hi, thanks for coming. <clears throat> I have two questions. First, what's the best response that we should take for the Iranian prolifer proliferation threat? And um, I forgot the second one. So. Okay. I think that might be a good one for Secretary. You remind Perry. me of Governor Perry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, lear I learned in politics a long time ago when you're going to say something about numbers, don't ever use the numbers. Say, I, wanna, I have a few questions to ask. <laughs> <laughs> you can stop at two or three or four. Nobody knows. <laughs> I think on the Iranian issue, we're missing a very important thing that we should have been doing and could do now that would give our diplomacy more bite. One of the things you learn when you try to do diplomacy is that if you have no strength and you go to the bargaining table, you're going to get your head handed to you. You've got to bring strength. Now, Iran has been conducting what is virtually acts of war for a long time by their support for Hezbollah, by their terrorist acts around the world, by things that they are doing, um, this recent um, apprehension of somebody who was out to assassinate on US soil, a Saudi ambassador, and so on. And we don't do anything about those types of things. And I think we need to hit them back. I'll give an example. In the, the 1980s, late 80s, the Iranians started to play around with Kuwaiti shipping. So we reflagged the ships to our flag so we could guard them. And while the president of Iran was in the United Nations saying the last thing in the world Iran would do would put a mine in the Persian Gulf, our Navy was taking pictures of them doing it. So we boarded the ship, took off the sailors, and took off some mines for evidence, sank the ship, took the sailors to Dubai and said, come and get your sailors and cut it out. Now, that was communication. And I think we need, we need some of that um, hard reaction back to these provocations that Iran is constantly uh, doing. My, uh, my second question was, um, given that we're not going to be able to get rid of nuclear weapons today, unfortunately. Uh, what are your thoughts on the aging of the nuclear arsenal and the reliable replacement warhead program? What was that question? It was about the aging uh, arsenal and the reliable uh, warhead program. Bill, why don't you feel that one? We haven't tested a bomb or built a new bomb for several decades now. And so this deterrence which we have today comes whether we have 100 or 1,000 or 2,000, it comes from weapons which are 30, 40 years old and being carried by missiles, which are almost as old. So the question is, how do we maintain confidence in our arsenal under those conditions? We have at the, at the laboratory something which is actually created when I was Secretary of Defense back in 1996, I believe it was, uh, called the Stockpile Stewardship Program, in which we use uh, the most advanced technology, the most advanced computers for checking out the reliability of our nuclear weapons and for taking corrective actions when they need to be taken. Uh, this program has been enormously successful, and I have great confidence in it. As far as I can assess, uh, our nuclear stockpile will remain reliable without testing, without building new weapons for decades to come. I hope that by that time we have had some success in the endeavor we're on so that the question of the reliability of the stockpiles goes away because we don't have stockpiles. But in any event, with high confidence, I can say that we can maintain this 
uh, the reliability of the present stockpile for decades into the future. And we're doing it because of very, very sophisticated, very advanced technology, including using the most powerful computers in the, in the world to simulate what's going on. One other comment on that, we have just a few miles from here at Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, a program called the National Ignition Facility. The goal of that facility is, is to create fusion by having almost 200 very high-powered lasers direct their energy at one very, very small spot and cause a, a fusion to take place, which, rec which recreates the energy, the, the temperatures of the, of, the, of, the, of the sun, higher than the sun, actually. So what they are doing there is basically, in the laboratory, creating the, the same conditions you would have when a nuclear bomb goes off. So we will be able to simulate a nuclear bomb with amazing fidelity in just, in just a few years in the future. We're already doing a pretty good job of it. Short answer to your question is several decades into the future, high confidence, because of the highly qualified scientists we have in our laboratories and highly sophisticated computers they use, all of which lead to very uh, high fidelity simulation, which then can be used to cor correct any problems that, that are disclosed. Thank you. Please. Thank you for honoring uh, you, us with, with your presence. Uh, I have uh, several questions. Speak, speak up a little bit, please. I have several questions. Uh, Just my, one at a time. The first, one, the first one is, can you help me understand? Uh, you, you said, uh, Mr. Perry, you, you, I believe you said uh, Russia has a lot of instability uh, around itself and therefore needs to maintain a higher count of nuclear warheads. But at the same time, uh, are they not the ones who are exporting uh, nuclear technology to Iran? And how does that make them uh, more stable? And then my second question is, we seem to be, I mean, there's a lot of reliance in nuclear energy on the uh, uranium fuel cycle. Whereas we know, and we have developed technology in the United States in the 60s uh, around uh, the thorium nuclear cycle, which has, uh, if, not, if not zero, uh, a much smaller amount of uh, fissile byproducts. Is anybody looking at actually offering uh, the world who needs energy, you know, like a, a perhaps less uh, dangerous solution? So, Bill, do you want to talk first about uh, Russia's position? Let me, let me ask Sam to comment on that second point, which I think is we, the key we point. Were, we were frustrated for a number of years because Russia was, as you've said, uh, furnishing uh, technology and so forth for the Bashir reactor in Iran. Uh, they finally came around to a position after a lot of discussion to taking back all the fuel from that. So there is a closed loop here now, and we do, we, we, that's acceptable because Iran has a right for nuclear power, nuclear research, and so forth. Where Iran has gone wrong is they've been cheating. Uh, they have not fulfilled their nonproliferation objectives. They have the right to enrich. So Russia is doing better on that count. Where Russia has not been nearly as forthcoming, and China, as we would like, is on tightening the screws on sanctions. Uh, there, are, there are a couple of, of, of the, Iran is basically a dark cloud, but there are a couple of little light spots on it. Uh, one is that the, the Iranian economy is now, and this is unfortunate for the Iranian people, but it's better than conflict. Um, they are suffering, basically. Their currency has gone down very appreciably, so sanctions are beginning to really squeeze, and more and more countries are joining in those exceptions, Russia and China. But even in there, they will be negotiating a lower oil price because the Europeans are cutting off their oil purchase. So the, the, the bright, one little bright spot is the economy is beginning to pinch, and I think the, we may see a little more uh, forthcoming from the Iranians, hopefully. The second one is and this is one I think we need to be very careful about. Uh, it's certainly one that um, I don't put complete faith in, but the Ayatollah keeps saying that developing a nuclear weapon or possessing a nuclear weapon would be a sin. I think there ought to be some moral engagement, not by our government necessarily, but by the Vatican and other religious leaders. I think we need to engage them on a religious basis. Now, do I believe that based on what the Iranian government is doing? No, I don't. But I do think it's a place for the Iranians to land if they ever back down without losing face. So those are the two very tiny bright spots that I would point out. But let me defer to Bill on the alternative there. 
I, I believe the Russians are fully convinced that nuclear proliferation poses a threat, not just to the United States, not, but to them as well. And in fact, if anything, they are probably in greater danger of a nuclear attack in their country than we are in the United States. And I think they understand that. So by and large, they are doing the things they need to do in this field. Unfortunately, some of the things they need to do are adverse to their economic interests. And so there's a, there's a tension there that some groups of the Russian government who are pushing their, including their atomic energy, uh, what's called uh, Rosatom, is more interested in, in selling reactors than they are in the proliferation issue. But the Russian government at the highest level is fully aware of the, of the proliferation danger and is, and is positive about it, and is taking some positive actions to deal with it. There was a question. One thing uh, we could do in the nego there's now a negotiation taking place. And I don't see why we don't table a proposition like this. You say that you're enriching uranium for peaceful purposes. You are enriching a volume of uranium that far exceeds anything you might possibly need in Iran. Therefore, you must be doing it in anticipation of selling it into the international market. Welcome. And let's set up an arrangement whereby we have supervision of plants and we give you access to the international market and uh, put that proposition out there. There was a question uh, coming in from another location Thank about you. applying new technologies uh, to uh, nuclear reactors, including the use of thorium. Bill, is there some uh, reactor technology revolution around the corner that would uh, help us with uh, fuel cycle security mm -hmm. issues and also safety issues of reactors? Yeah, you can certainly build new reactors with much safer technology than we than in the reactors that presently exist. And we ought to be doing that as we go to new reactors. One, one, off, one uh, candidate is something called the small modular reactor, which is now being under study at, at our Department of Energy. But whatever we do in that regard, the, there are tons and tons of high-enriched uranium out there. There are countries all over the world using reactors. They're going to be using them for 10, 20, 30 years into the future. So that highly enriched uranium is going to, that uranium is going to be out there. The technology for making highly enriched uranium is going to be out there. So even if we pivot to new technologies for the new reactors, we'll have for decades a huge problem with the reactors that currently exist, which have another 20, 30 years lifetime in them and the uranium that they use. We're also trying our best to get, get countries around the globe and private sector to use low enriched uranium instead of high enriched uranium. In some cases, that's a, a very expensive process. It's going to take a long time. That's beginning to happen, slowly, uh, not quite surely. Please. Hi. Um, getting back to the Middle East, uh, Israel has argued that uh, they need to attack Iran in a year or so, or else it's too late. Um, Obama seems to temper them, but, you know, voices strong support for Israel. Uh, I just was curious about your, anybody's analysis of the situation. Well, the Israelis, understandably, hear the Iranians say they want to wipe you out five times a day. And if they have a nuclear weapon on the end of a missile, they could do it. So you believe them. And just when uh, it becomes impossible to really stop their uh, nuclear weapon program by a military attack is a question mark. And how good our intelligence is on this is a question mark. The Israelis obviously feel it a lot more than anybody else because they're closer and more threatened. Uh, so I think it's a very uh, difficult uh, issue for them. President Obama did say in the last uh, set of meetings something very significant, I thought. He said, we are not talking about containing a nuclear-armed Iran. We're talking about not allowing it to happen. That's a big conceptual statement. And just where it takes him in terms of timing, I have no idea. Let me add something to that. Uh, 
George has explained quite correctly why the Israelis are concerned, and deeply concerned, in an existential way they're concerned about an Iranian nuclear bomb. And they have indeed drawn up a plan for military attack. The question is, would they press the button and execute that plan? Uh, they understand, as well as we understand, that even if that attack succeeds, there would be a whole host of unintended consequences. And all of those unintended consequences are bad. So they do not want to have to press that button. The way we can help them make the decision not to press the button, not to conduct that attack, is be more successful with our diplomacy. It has to be, as George has indicated, the course of diplomacy. It has to get the Iranians' attention. It has to, and that means being much more successful on sanctions. Sanctions ordinarily are not effective. Iran, on the other hand, is highly susceptible to financial sanctions, cut, cutting off their access to international banks and so on. And to the extent they have been applied already, they have really gotten their attention. But it takes full cooperation from Russia and full cooperation from China in order to make those completely effective. So part of our diplomacy is directed to Iran, but another part of our diplomacy needs to be directed to Russia and China to get them fully behind those sanctions. I mean, add, add one other uh, point here. Uh, I think military use of force would be the last resort, but it is still on the table. Certainly it's on the table with Israel. It's on the table explicitly by the President of the United States. I think Iranians need to understand that. I think the other thing the Iranians need to understand, and I think we also have to understand it, is it's not, in my view, just a matter of taking out a few nuclear sites. If you're going to fly over there, you want to take out the air defense systems. And if you're in Israel, you want to take out the offensive systems that would, could be used in retaliation. And the Iranians, it seems to me, are, are not very wise in identifying the Persian Gulf as something they may target to close, because that certainly would make military targeters, if not political leaders, think that we may need to take out the Navy and parts of the Air Force. So this is not uh, two or three planes flying over Iran and dropping a few bombs and taking out a site or two. The number of sites is multiple. I do not think that would stop the Iranians in the long term. It would set them back for a while. But they need to understand the seriousness of what they're doing here. And I think we need to all understand this does have, as Bill Perry said, certainly a lot of consequences if we take it. It's not going to be a one-shot proposition. It's going to go on some time. The other part of the debate that goes back and forth is whether you can really deter the Iranians if they get a weapon. Now, you can argue that all day long, but if you're in Israel and you hear the threats being made over and over again, then you would not put much comfort in the fact that you might be able to deter them with your own capability of retaliation. So that, that argument, it seems to me, is, um, is not uh, very definitive. The final point I would make is it's not just a matter of deterring the Iranians. Even if you assume you could deter the Iranians, if the Iranians get nuclear weapons, it's going to set off a chain in the Middle East. I don't know how long it would take, but there's certainly inevitably going to be a number of other countries that have nuclear weapons. The more have the nuclear weapons, nuclear programs, enrichment, as we've already discussed, the more danger we have of, even if they're not used by a nation, they could be used by a terrorist group that doesn't have a return address if they get the material, mm -hmm. and it increases the likelihood of that. So this is not simply about deterrence. It's also a matter at the heart of proliferation. So there are two... Uh questions from remote locations that are very similar. I'll read you the one that's currently uh, visible. How could we best make average citizens aware of the current threat and the need for disarmament? It seems that the need is clear upon investigation, but how do we take this message to the masses? Or as the other questioner said, how do we uh, convey this and get ordinary citizens to do something about this? And I think, uh, Senator Nunn, you've been leading this uh, effort through an uh, organization that he co-chairs called the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Been working on this for many years. How do you get people uh, who work at Google, in the Bay Area, around the world, the average citizens uh, who don't wake up in the morning thinking about nuclear threats, uh, how do we get people to take this matter seriously? Well, I would, uh, there are a number of things, but let me just emphasize one and defer to George and Bill on this. But we did make a movie, uh, and we called it The Nuclear Tipping Point. And you can get that movie. We give it away free. Uh, George and Bill and Henry and I are on the movie. It's a, more of a documentary. It lasts about 30 or 40 minutes. 
Uh, it's called the Nuclear T Tipping Point. You can get it at nucleartippingpoint.org or you can go to our website called nti.org or .com. It works either way. So that's one way because it's an informative movie. It tells you where we're coming from. It tells you not only about the vision but about all the hard steps we have to take to get there. The other thing is understanding that the United States has a real stake in the whole global security and regional conflict. My view of it is that we're not talking about a world without nuclear weapons. Today's world simply subtracting nuclear weapons. You got to change a lot of things in the world. We talked already about the Middle East. We talked about the former Soviet Union and Russia and they have feeling that they depend on nuclear weapons. That's another whole area. We got to talk about North Korea, Northeast Asia. There are a lot of things that have to be done. And perhaps the most dangerous of all is India and Pakistan, because these are two heavily armed nuclear countries that have been to war several times. So all of those things have to be part of public awareness. But I would say directly, uh, take a look at that uh, movie, and I think it'll be uh, pretty informative. Let me build on what that. Sam was just saying. Um, we have had, I think, pretty good success, the small group of us, of getting the message across to the political elite and to the older generation. What we're trying to, but that doesn't, that doesn't, it's not adequate for dealing with the problem. We need to get across to the generation we see sitting. You may notice the people sitting in this room don't look much like us. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're about two generations separate. We created the problem, I guess, by building these nuclear weapons in the first place. Your generation has to be responsible for solving them. I teach a class at Stanford, and I try to inculcate and try to bring this message across to students here because I want them to take it out. But just think, if each person from Google, if even 20% of the Google people would say get the film that Sam was, talk, was talking about, the nuclear or, tipping or, or point. Or read the book. <laughs> or read the book. But whatever you do yourself, what I'm suggesting is call together, have a, need, have a uh, meeting with your friends, invite 10 of, 10 of your friends to your home, show them the movie, show them the book, and have a discussion among yourself. You get that, and then if each of the two or three of those 10 people would do the same thing, we start getting a multiplicative effect here going on and start getting the word out to hundreds of thousands or millions of people instead of hundreds of people. So that's the sort of thing that needs to be done, and it's really up to your generation to do it, which is why we're sitting here at Google talking to you. We're trying to get you interested, not in listening to this and becoming convinced yourself, but in doing something about it. And the first thing that has to be done is getting the message out. Because until the message is out, there's not going to be enough political will in the US Congress and, again, and other parliaments of the world to really take the action needed. You cannot take that action, but you can, help, you can take the action of getting the message out. Philip, I here's would an imagine example. That, that. Here, here's an example of something we're doing. This subject has great resonance with religious leaders. I mean, they look at it and said, where is it written? that a human being should have the ability to press a button and kill a million people. What is this anyway? Where's the morality? So we had uh, an inquiry from evangelicals a few years ago, said we want to come to Hoover and hear what's going on. So they came, we sent them some reading material. About 35 came, Bill talked to them, I talked to them. They spent a day talking about it. And they have since issued some very strong statements on behalf of evangelicals. Then there are the Catholic bishops who have made very strong statements on this. And then there is a really terrific guy here in San Francisco named Bill Swing. He's retired Episcopal Bishop of California. And he started something called United Religion Initiative. He has millions of people all over the world from all religions and the idea is, let's pick a few subjects on which we might agree and work on them. And he has picked this subject as one of his subjects. So these are ways of, we're always seeking ways to get this message out, as it says, and to get people to be concerned with the notion that if they are, then in the end, that's going to get reflected in political decision making. Let me, let me ask a question of Philip. You uh, outstanding journalist for many years. You could have written a book on many, many subjects. What was the motivation for writing this book at this time for you? I think the motivation began in uh, 1988. I was the Moscow bureau chief of the New York Times and uh, for the first time in the history of the Cold War, 
uh, the Soviet Union invited a group of American scientists to come and witness a nuclear test, underground nuclear test at, a test at the Soviet test site in Kazakhstan, and I was invited to go along to write about it. Uh, and uh, when you are present at a nuclear test, even an underground nuclear test, it leaves a lasting impression. Uh, the bomb went off about a half a mile below the Earth's surface, uh, and then I stood there <coughs> and watched as a shock wave uh, rippled across the Kazakhstan steppe. It looked like a tsunami, except it was the Earth was moving, uh, and it literally rippled across uh, for a mile and a half until it hit the site where I was standing with these scientists. It almost knocked us over. Uh, and that is where the motivation to write this book began. Uh, and then I went to uh, uh, Hiroshima later. I saw the, uh, what's left there of the damage caused by our attack on Hiroshima. Uh, I went to Los Alamos to try to understand the origins of the bomb. Uh, and all of this, as someone who covered national security affairs during the Cold War, realizing the degree of danger that we had of a nuclear conflagration with the Soviet Union. I sort of woke up again in, in 2007 and 8 after this uh, article came out that the four men uh, wrote, uh, and I, I recalled all of these things I've just cited to you, and I said, there's a book here that should be written, and it should be written because we need to get people around the world to understand the threat that exists and to try to do something about it. So. Let's see, we're sort of towards the end of our time frame here. So we'll do, uh, if, you, uh, if you'll apologize, one more question or two. Let's do two here uh, in Mountain View, and then we'll call it a day. Thank you. So I'll make a quick two-part question. The first is about unknown or untracked threats. Can't hear you. The first one is about unknown or untracked threats. You've talked about reduction in strategic stockpiles. Do we know enough about what was disseminated from the AQCon network across the world? Is that material uh, tr tracked or bounded? Um, and the second part of that question, somewhat related, is, is there enough engagement from leaders in previous and current US administrations to prevent an India-Pakistan nuclear exchange following a likely terrorist strike? Let me tackle the last one. It's really important. And about, when was it, six months ago, Bill and I convened a group of Indian and Pakistani former foreign ministers, former generals, and so on, who still have uh, some influence in their governments. And we sat at our conference room at Hoover for two days and discussed what they how they might compose themselves better. They did produce a, re a very impressive set of confidence building measures in the nuclear area that they all signed on to and presented to their governments. Maybe more important, we talked about the, the opportunities for economic advancement that they're missing by virtue of the tension that's present. Tried to get that up there. But I would say at the same time, I think, Bill, on side conversations with uh, some of the Pakistani generals, you say, well, what's worrying you the most? And they all say, a nuclear war. Because there are all these people who have a stake in India-Pakistan enmity. And somebody could go and do another Mumbai. And probably the Indians would not be able to be as restrained as they were after the first Mumbai. And that could lead to an invasion, which could lead to the start of a nuclear exchange. So you've got to be really worried about that. That's why I just would underline what Sam said a minute ago, that it's not the present world without nuclear weapons, that you've got to, do, you've got to work at these problem areas and see if there's something that can be done to settle them down. Let me add one, one point. I agree with everything George said on it, but there was an American scientific magazine uh, a year or so ago that just used uh, supercomputers to play the uh, hypothetical scenario of 100 weapons going off between India and Pakistan. And they projected, and even if you divide this by half or a quarter, it still tells you the story that 
couple of hundred million people would be killed if a hundred weapons went off between the two. Uh, but over the next five years, six years, there would be a billion people or more that would starve to death because of the co cooling effect of the atmosphere. Uh, so th this is not simply a sovereign problem. This is much bigger. It's a global problem. We have the capacity of using nuclear energy to really greatly better mankind, or we have the capacity to destroy God's universe. And I think that all of us have a stake in that all over the world. And the network was a, a bazaar, an arms bazaar. And I don't think we have had enough access to know how extensive it was. We know a lot, but not enough. Right. Thank you. OK, last uh, question. Thank you. Uh, so nuclear energy has potential to change the world in terms of carbon dioxide reduction, but a lot of the technologies involve uranium or plutonium in the fuel cycle in some way. If somebody comes out and invents a new nuclear power technology that does not require uranium, plutonium, or any of those materials in the fuel cycle so that there, you know, in a couple of years, there's absolutely no economic reason to refine uranium or plutonium, uh, does that give you a tool in the arms and proliferation reduction? In other words, that there should be no reason anybody is refining any volume whatsoever of those fuels. Obviously, the answer is yes. On the other hand, as Bill pointed out, there are lots of nuclear power plants in operation and under construction right now, mostly in China and India, but a couple in Sam's state of Georgia. And they're going to be going on for quite a while. So Don't we have enough bomb pits to keep those busy <laughs> for a while? <laughs> So we've got, we've got enough nuclear material out there. I agree it would be a real breakthrough. I mean, hopefully we can get to that. But there's enough nuclear material out there to make 40,000, 50,000 nuclear weapons. Um, and so we've got a, your generation is going to have a continuing challenge. This is a dynamic, continuing problem, but we can make a lot of progress. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all. And uh, as uh, Bill Perry's put it, I hope uh, that uh, from this discussion, some of you will uh, um, you know, think seriously about these issues and think about how you might uh, uh, get involved in trying to deal with them because it's a worldwide problem and the last thing we want to have happen is wake up someday and discover that uh, New York or Washington or London or Paris or whatever city has been or Palo Alto. destroyed by a nuclear weapon. Thank you very much for coming. But just, just one final word. You can't, you can't imagine how hard it is to take this subject and write a book about it. <laughs> that is really a challenge. Philip has done a great job, so his book is, uh, I think, uh, very well worth reading. And I'm not getting any part of the commission. <laughs> <laughs>